Amen. So Deuteronomy 15, uh, the Bible reads there in verse 1, At the end of every seven years thou shalt make a release, and this is the manner of the release. Every creditor that lendeth aught to his, his neighbor shall release it. He shall not exact it of his neighbor or of his brother, because it is called the Lord's release. Of a foreigner thou mayest exact it again, but that which is thine, uh, that which is thine uh, with thy brother, uh, thine hand shall release. So this was a law that ga God had in the Old Testament, where that every seven years, if you were indebted to somebody, of course, this is within the tribe, the tribes of Israel, the nation of Israel, that you were going to be set free from that debt. And that, that God did not want to have people just be in this perpetual state of, of indebtedness to other people. And uh, we're going to see here, you know, that, that debt, first of all, is a form of bondage. You say, why is this so important to God? I thought people got very rich making, uh, you know, by lending and putting others in debt. And that's very true. I mean, you have to just go look at any, you know, city skyline that is of any size, and you're going to see a lot of tall buildings, and a lot of them are going to be owned by banks, you know, and they got that way by a lot of, you know, lending. Um, but God's system, you know, he does not want people he held in debt because debt is a form of bondage. And if you would, keep something in Deuteronomy. Go over to Proverbs chapter 6. Go over to Proverbs chapter 6. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. The borrower is servant to the lender. What it's saying there is that if you owe somebody some money, you know, you, you are servant to them. That they are going to have, you know, you know, a foothold in your life, and that's very true. You know, uh, think about, you know, try to not try not paying the credit card bills and see what happens. Try not paying. You know, we we wouldn't really call it a le uh, loaning, although it kind of is a form when, it, when we talk about income tax. It's an involuntary loan to the government. You know, they're going to say, hey, you're going to lend this money. We might pay it back at the end of the year, right? Try not paying that. And see how quickly they don't come along and garnish your wages or even throw you in jail because you become servant to the lender. Now, this is also a principle that's biblical as well, that a person who is indebted is to become a servant to the one whom they owe. That was another way out of the debt, that they would actually begin to work for that person. They would have to work off their debt. So we'll get into that here in a minute. But what I want us to see, first of all, is why is this so important to God? That every seven years, everyone's released from this debt is because debt is a form of bondage. And if we're in debt, you know, we should work very hard to get out of debt as soon as possible. Uh, you know, because that's, that, you know, your income is a very powerful tool to do things in your life. And if you're constantly shelling out all this money and interest every month, you know, year after year after year, that's a lot of wasted money. And you have nothing to show for it, really, except for maybe some, you know, cheap gifts or something or whatever you got with the Amazon card or the Chase card or you know, maybe you were like me when I got into serious debt and just spent it all on food, right? You know, duh. You know, I guess I do have something to show for that, but it's not really something you really want to show, right? <laughs> but if you're in debt, you should work to get out of debt. You know, you should work hard. And that's what we see in Proverbs 6 where I have you. Look there in verse 1. It says, My son, if thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with the stranger, thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. Do this now, my son, and deliver thyself. When thou art come into the hand of thy friend, go, humble thyself, and make sure thy friend. Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. Deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of the hunter, and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways, and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in, summertime, in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou rise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands, so shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth, and they want as an armed man. The Bible's teaching us here, look, if we've stricken hands, if we've been surety, you know, if we've said, hey, we're going to, you know, that'd be kind of like a co-signer on a loan, that you need to deliver yourself from that. You should not be indebted to other people. And he's, he likens it unto, you know, a, a deer escaping a hunter. Because that's, what, uh, that's, that's the, the imagery that he's using there. That's what we need to look at it like. That, that these lenders are not just out to make some money. They, I mean, they want everything they can get. You know, what's, what's the percentage rate that cap you out? 24.99. You know, the, they passed a law years ago that predatory lending, right? It's like you could only charge so much interest. Well, they, they send you that credit card. They want it as high as they can. They want to get every bit of it out of, the, out of you as they can. And he's saying, look, if you're in that position, if you've stricken hands, if you've been surety, you know, you need to deliver yourself. You need to not give rest to your eyes. You know, another one way to do that, to, to, to interpret this, you know, and apply to your life today 
would be maybe it's time to get that second job and pay off that debt. Maybe it's time to put in an extra 10, 20 hours at work and get that debt paid off. Maybe go through a season of hardship and difficulty where you're not around as much, but you know what? You're not, you're not, might not be as home as much, but you know what? You're, you're going to pay off some debt and you're going to get your, you're going to deliver yourself from this bondage that you're in. Now, of course, there is an exception here in Deuteronomy, and you can go ahead and turn back there. He says, look, there's, there's one exception. You're going to release everybody from their indebtedness unless this exception. There gives one exception to that. Save when there shall be no poor among you. So he's saying, look, if everybody's doing well, if everybody's wealthy and, you're, and you want to lend, then go ahead and do it. But he's saying, save when there shall be no poor among you, for the Lord shall greatly bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for inheritance to possess it. So God's fully anticipating. God's saying, look, it's, it's perfectly possible that I'm going to bless you so much in this land that you're going to inherit that there won't even be any poor among you. That there won't even be a need to release people every seven years. <clears throat> and now, that was a, now I believe this was a very rare exception. In fact, I don't think this ever happened. And I believe that's because of the stipulations that, that is attached in verse 5. He says, only if thou hearken unto the voice of the Lord, uh, thy Lord thy God, to observe to do all these commandments which I command thee this day. So the only way that was ever going to happen, that they were going to have all this abundance and, and blessing and wealth, so that there weren't even any poor in the land, is if they carefully, <coughs> excuse me, carefully hearkened unto the voice of the Lord their God. Which we know, if we've read the story, they did not do. In fact, they, don't, they didn't observe many of the Sabbaths, and God ends up having to punish them later and take them out of the land and leave it laid desolate. So, that was a rare exception. There was, of course, the possibility that if everybody's doing great, hey, there is no need for a release, you know, when there is no poor among you. But the only way there was ever going to be any poor, uh, no poor among them is if they carefully hearkened unto the Lord their God, which they did not do. So I don't believe there was ever a time in their history where there was no poor among them, that there was always poor among them. I mean, if we'll recall what Jesus noted in the New Testament, you have the, you have the poor with you always. You know, that was the case then. And even here in this chapter, in verse 11, if you look there at verse 11, you get a, you get a hint of that as well, that God's kind of already anticipating the fact that they were always going to have these poor people with them. Look at verse 11. For the poor shall never cease out of the land. So here in verse 5, he's saying, look, or verse 4, he's saying, look, if there's no poor among you, there's no need for a lease. Then in verse, verse 11, but the poor will never cease out of the land. Why? Because they are not going to carefully hearken to the Lord their God like they were supposed to, and God foreknew this. <coughs> he goes on in verse 6 and says, For the Lord God, uh, thy God blesseth thee as he promised, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, but thou shalt not borrow. And thou shalt reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over thee. What this is showing us is that people who are lending money are powerful. It's a, it's a sign of influence and power, and, and, and that's, you know, that's why God doesn't want that to be the case for them. That because again, the, servant or the, 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 the borrower is servant to the lender. It applies to individuals and even nations. He says in verse 7, If there be among you a poor, uh, a poor man of one of thy brethren within thy gates in thy land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not harden thine heart, nor shut thine hand from thy poor brother, but thou shalt open thine hand wide unto him, and shalt certainly lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wanteth. Okay, So God is not about, you can see God's care for the poor here. That God cares about poor people. He, doesn't, he wants to help people who are suffering financially and with other needs. Now it says here that they were not to harden their heart or shut up their hand. from, uh, and he were, They were to open wide their hand and lend unto them that was sufficient for his need and that which he wanteth. Of course, wanteth is not talking about you know, whatever the guy wants. It's talking about what he's lacking. Wanteth is just another word for what he lacks. You know, he's working, he's putting in the work, but he's coming up short. You know, and we've probably all been there. Uh, you know, it, it, there's just sometimes, you know, it's, we're doing everything we can, but that bill comes due that we weren't expecting, and it's got to get paid. There's, we're wanting something. There's something lacking. We have need, right? So they were saying, look, don't, don't harden your heart. You know, open your hand wide. But he's not saying give, uh, he's saying give as they need. He's not saying give to every lazy bum. Give to every jerk who asks of you. That's not what he's saying here. Give to every able-bodied individual who could easily go out and get you know, a, a, a low-paying job and start to pull himself up out of the gutter. Give to that guy. You know, if, if we were going to give that guy what, he, what was sufficient for his need, it would be a, a swift kick in the pants. That's what we would give him. 
you know, we give them a strong rebuke. Hey, go get a job, bum. Quit being, quit sitting around on the corner like a lazy jerk and quit making a mess everywhere and go get a job. That would be what he needs. But we don't want to go to that extreme to where like every single person who ever has a need is just some lazy jerk because that's not always the case. You know, if we have a brother who has a real need, you know, has a real, you know, they've fallen on hard times. You know, maybe it's a medical emergency, some unforeseen expense. You know, life, life does that. Uh, you know, we should be willing to step in and help and give as we are able and to help them uh, make up that which is wanting. <coughs> you know, I, th I've, I've know for myself, I've fallen on such hard times like that. I remember years ago when we first moved here, you know, we we're working hard, trying to do everything we can, and something came up and we were going to come up short on the rent. And I had to go to somebody and I had to borrow some the money and I said, look, I don't have it right now. I'm going to have it in a few weeks. It's just the timing with the paycheck and everything. And and it's not because I'm not working. It's not because, you know, we're, we're you know, wasting our money on, on frivolous things. It's just, it's just that's the way life goes sometimes. And you're starting out trying to, in a new career. It's low paying, you know, all these, you know, so on and so forth. Things happen. Life happens. And I had to go to this person and say, hey, you know, I, can I borrow some money? And you know what? They, they lent me that money and I paid it back in a few weeks. You know, that I was able to pay him back, <coughs> you know, and... Uh, if that were ever happen again, you know, when things get tight, sometimes we just need to work more. You know, sometimes we just need to go out and, and, and get after it. But I want to point out something here. God's not talking about just giving them money and never, you know, and, and, not, and not expecting it back. I mean, that's a good thing to do. You should be able to do it. In fact, the person I borrowed that money from was so generous that I went to pay him back. They said, what's this for? I said, I borrowed that money from, it was like hundreds of dollars. I'm like, I borrowed that from you a few weeks ago? Oh, yeah, that's right. And that's how willing, how generous uh, this person was that they just gave this money and totally forgot about it. But we should pay that money back when we are able. And that's kind of what God is saying here. You know, the release, the point of the release was maybe people just get to a point where they can never pay it back, where it's just, it's just not going to happen. It's a bondage. And, you know, I've, I've been indebted to people and, and not been able to pay it back for a while. And finally, they just came and said, you know what, I we'll just forget about the money. You know, and I've worked hard since then and I've be in that position again. Of course, that was a long time ago. But that kind of thing happens. You know, the point being is that God wants the money to be paid back. And uh, the Bible says in Psalm 37, it says, The wicked borroweth and payeth not again. <coughs> it says, The wicked borroweth and payeth not again. So the Bible says it's a wicked thing to borrow money. Because borrow, that's what that infers, Right. You know, if you were to lend me something, I were to borrow it, you're expecting it back, right? So if I borrow and I pay it not again, the Bible says that is wicked to not pay it back. You know, and I heard somebody recently say, well, that just, that just means that, well, that's only something the wicked do. The only wicked people do that. Like, you know, that's for unsaved people. It's like, no, what that's saying is that's wicked to do. Not that it's only the wicked that do that. That only applies to unsaved people. I'm like, what? What? You, what? <laughs> Unsaved people can be wicked, or saved people can be wicked. You know, saved people can still do rotten things. You know, uh, <coughs> they still have the flesh. They can still get into sin. They can still uh, make mistakes. So, not saying only the wicked. It's not saying that only the wicked do this, but rather that this is a wicked thing to do to borrow money from somebody with no intention of paying it back. And you know, this this would apply you know to us if we were thinking, well, I've got all this credit card debt, but you know what, I I'm not going to pay it back. People do that. People go out and they rack up all these thousands of dollars in credit card debt and just say, eh, forget it. I'm not going to pay it back. The Bible says that's a wicked attitude. You know, it's a wicked thing to do, to, to spend other people's money. You know, and whether you want to say, well, it's wrong for them to charge all that interest and this and that, it's like, yeah, but you signed the paper. But you, you knew how it worked when you started uh, you know, sliding that plastic through the machine. And uh, it's a wicked thing if we're just going to borrow things from people and ha with no intention of ever paying it back. Now, maybe, you know, we borrow something, we borrow money from somebody, we have every intention of paying it back, but it just seems like we can never get there, we can never get traction. You know, that's what the seven years was for, to where the people could just be released and get back on their feet and start over again. But again, it's not just, you know, lending to every bum that needs it. It's for people who are really, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, you know uh, falling on hard times. Look here in verse 9, we'll move on. It says here, Beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of the re release is at hand, and thy eye be evil against thy poor brother, and thou givest him not, and he cry unto the Lord against thee, and it be sin unto thee. So he's saying, look, you know, if, if it's like, the, hey, the seventh the year of release is, you know, six months away, 
and you come to me and be like, hey, I need to borrow a thousand bucks to get, uh, you know, this, this rent paid or whatever it is, you know, you want to borrow something. And I'm like, yeah, well, you know, I know if you don't pay it off within six months, then I have to let it go. So, uh, nah, you know what? No. You know, and I heart, what would be, that'd be me hard. If, you know, if, if I knew I had more time that you were going to be able to pay me back before you just got off scot-free or whatever, you know, <laughs> he's saying, look, don't have that attitude. Don't be this person that's going to get all stingy because you know the year of release is right around the corner. You know, you should be willing to help your brother out. Why? Because it's the right thing to do. To help somebody out who has a genuine need. That's the right thing to do. And not to harden our heart, not to, be, uh, and then let it not grieve us. You know, oh, here you go. Even giving it grudgingly. Well, I guess I have to. You know, we should be willing. We should be thankful that God has given us the blessing and that we, we're, God has put us in such a position that we can even be a blessing on other people. You know, and God is the one who's given us power to get wealth. You know, if we have extra and we can be liberal with it and help other people out, you know, we should be glad. We should be thankful that we can buy. Jesus said it is, blessed, it is more blessed to give than to receive. That's a, that's a Christian virtue to be able to be generous. <coughs> you know, generosity is a Christian virtue. Look there at verse 10. He says, thou shalt surely give him and thine heart shall not be grieved when thou givest unto him. Because for that, uh, this, uh, for this, that for this thing, the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works and in all that thou puttest thine hand to do. So, it's kind of a, you know, he's saying, look, if you lend and you do it with the right heart, you know, I'll bless you for it. You know, that, that you, when someone comes to you and has a need, you should, should not be like, oh, great. Now I got to help this, this guy out. Or I'm going to be out of thought. You should just think, here's an opportunity for me, for God to bless me, for me to help a brother out. And uh, God's going to see it. And I'm doing it out of right motive. And you know what? And I know God's going to bless me. And uh, it might not be today or the next day. But, you know, if, if we cast our bread upon the waters, you know, we'll receive it again after many days, the Bible says. So we should be willing to do that. Go over to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Because generosity is a Christian virtue. We should be very generous people. We should be willing to give and, and, to, and to do it willingly and not grudgingly. It shouldn't grieve us at our heart. The Bible says, you're going to Luke 6. It says in Exodus 22, If thou lend money to any of my people that is poor by thee, that shall not be to him an usurer, neither shalt thou lay upon him usury. That's interest. He's saying, look, if you're going to lend to the poor, don't charge interest. It's a wicked thing to charge interest. And you should never lend to a brother in Christ and charge him interest, ever, at any time. If thou, take, if thou at all take thy uh, neighbor's raiment to pledge, thou shalt deliver it unto him by, the t by that the sun goeth down. He's like, you know, he, he says, hey, I need to borrow this. Well, Give me your coat that I, so I know you'll come back and pay me or, or bring that back. God's saying, you better not keep that coat before the sun goes down. You don't even get to have it for a day. You don't even get to have it for 12 hours. You better take that coat back and give it to him and not take it as a pledge. He said, for that is his covering. Only it is his raiment for his skin. Wherein shall he sleep? And it shall come to pass when he crieth unto me that I will hear, for I am gracious. You know, God's the one who eventually who hears about it when the, when the poor cry. When the people were being oppressed because of you know uh, you know financial situation, someone's taking advantage of their of their poverty. You know God, God notices that. God will hear it. You're there in Luke chapter six. Look at verse thirty five. He says, "But love ye your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again." You know even your enemies. We should Jesus is saying, "Look, you should lend hoping nothing again, for nothing again." Say, "I'm going to give this to you, and I don't expect anything in return." That's the attitude we're supposed to have. And, you know, that's, that's not always the easiest attitude to have, is it? Sometimes we get pretty attached to our things. We get pretty attached to stuff that's in our, in our wallet. You know, we get attached to our money. But he's saying here, look, you should be willing to just kiss it all goodbye. You just say, here, take it. Hoping for nothing again. Lend. Hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great. It's not just like, you know, God's going to not, God's going to notice that. And he's going to reward you for it. And you shall be children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. You know, that's, if you'd had that kind of an attitude, you would be the children of the highest. What does that mean? It means you'd be, you would be emulating our Father which is in heaven. You, it would be a God-like thing to do. And you think about that's very true. I mean, for our, he became poor for our sakes that we might be made rich through him. You know, Jesus, you know, he left all heaven, he left all his glory, and came down here and condescended to man. He didn't have to do anything. He didn't owe us that. You know, he lent his own life. He spread, you know, spilled his own blood for us. 
expecting nothing again in return. He just did what he needed to do. And uh, <clears throat> that's something, you know, God is very gracious. You think about it, God is very generous. You know, God is very gracious towards us. If we do that, if we have that same attitude, you know, that's us displaying that same uh, attribute. That's us, you know, being the children of the highest. That's how people are going to know. That's how our righteousness is going to shine before men. He says, give, verse 38, give and it shall be given unto you. You know, it just might not be that person you gave it to that gives it to you. Maybe God will open up another avenue. Maybe your business will be blessed. Maybe you'll get a raise. You know, maybe you'll fall in hard times and somebody will be there to help you out. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. That's a very important principle to keep in mind. You know, and it makes me think a lot about our church, Faithful Word Baptist Church. You know, we have the opportunity to do a lot of, of great works for God that a lot of other churches don't. You know, we, we're very blessed. We have enough resources that we can rent this building and buy nice new chairs and, you know, pay a guy to come down here and preach. And, you know, and our pastor, you know, he can, he can devote himself full time to ministry and we can do, you know, we can expand the building and we can paint nice murals and we can print, print tracks and buy Bibles and print, make DVDs and hand them out and go on all kinds of mission trips. All of that ca costs money, you know, and so that, and, and, and it costs a lot of money when you add it all up. You know, and why is it that faithful word always has, seems to have enough? That there's never, we've never been lacking. We've never been in debt. We've always been able to do these things. It's because, because the faithful word Baptist church is a church that gives. It's not just going to pile up in the, in the coffers. The, the money that comes in goes right back out into the work of God. And God knows that. And I believe that's why he opens up the fountains of heaven or the windows of heaven upon us. And that's why he gives back into our bosom. Because we give unto others, you know, through the preaching of the gospel and through the distributing of materials and so on and so forth. <clears throat> if you would, turn over to uh, James chapter 2. James chapter 2. You're going to James chapter 2. The Bible says in Leviticus 25, And if thy brother uh, be waxen and poor and fall and decay with thee, uh, then thou shalt relieve him. Yea, though he be a stranger or a sojourner, <clears throat> that he may live with thee. Uh, take thou no usury of him or increase, but fear thy God that thy brother may live with thee. Thou shalt not give him thy money upon usury, nor lend him thy victuals for increase. As God's, you know, you can see over and again, he's against this taking advantage of people's poverty and need. Look there in James chapter 2, verse 15. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, right? You know, that's, that's, that's a really poor person. I don't think we, any of us even in this room even knows what it even means to be poor. Most people in America will never even come close to this. You know, even in what we would consider some of the most poorest areas in the world, they still have, like, shelter. They still have, you know, food. They still have clothing. I mean, <coughs> and that's, those are the things that God promises, by the way. Those are the things that he's, he knows are needful and that he will give to us is our, our food and our clothing and our food and our raiment. That's what God promised us. <clears throat> and nothing more but you know he's saying here if thy brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food of daily food he's not saying you know if they be standing on the street corner with a sign that says anything helps while smoking a cigarette and checking their cell phone that's not destitute that's not poor that's lazy there's a huge difference I know I kind of go off but every chance I get I'm gonna because these guys drive me nuts because they always ask me you know and I've talked about this before it just must be something on my face. And they just say, here comes the sucker. You know, and, and they say, let's ask this guy. And I'm like, what, do I look that? I'm trying to grow the beard back so I look a little meaner. You know, like, Ugh. don't ask me for nothing. You know, <laughs> but you know, that's, that's what true uh, being destitute truly is. And that's the kind of poverty we're talking about here. Look, I don't have clothes to wear. I mean, you know, my clothes are wearing out. I don't have anything, you know, especially back then. We didn't just, you didn't just go down to, you know, Ross dress for less or the Goodwill or something like that and, and spend a few bucks and pick up a bunch of clothes. Back then, everything was made, you know, it was much more difficult and much more expensive to get good, durable clothing. And he says, in destitute of daily food. You know, they, they don't have anything to eat. And then he goes in verse 16, and one of you saying, to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled. You know, he's not saying, look, it's not enough to just say, well, God bless you. You know, you come with, they come out through their threadbare jeans and they pull out their pockets and like, I haven't eaten in days. Oh, God bless you. You know, God bless you. Be warmed and filled. You know, he's saying, look, that's the, that's the time for you to step up <clears throat> and reach into your own pocket and put some clothes on their back. 
and buy them a bag of groceries and do the, give them those things which are needful for the body. Otherwise, what does it profit? I mean, how is that a Christian virtue? I mean, you can say God bless you all, you all you want, but if you're not giving them those things that they need, then it's not really a virtue at all. It's just you sounding uh, spiritual. Go over to Matthew chapter 6. You know, uh, generosity is a Christian value. You should be willing to give. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes chapter 11, the Bible says, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Give it a portion to seven and also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. He's saying, look, a good reason for you to give is because you never know when it's going to come time where you have need. You know, it might come back around to where it's like, it might be you who's daily, who destitute of daily food. And uh, that's why Jesus says here in Matthew 6, if you're there, look at verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. <laughs> you can apply this to generosity, giving, forgiveness. You know, it, you might be the one who needs somebody to forgive you one day. You might be the one who's in need of somebody to help you out financially or whatever it is one day. You know, Jesus said, do unto others, do unto men as you would have them to do unto you. That ought to be the attitude that we have. So when we're, you know, when we're given an opportunity to help somebody, you know, maybe we should stop and think, well, what if I were in their position? What would I want somebody to do for me? You know, uh, we, should, we should consider that before we speak or make our decision. And uh, <coughs> I think that would, that would help us to, you know, stay out of hot water and make sure that when that time does come that, you know, we're going to be taken care of as well. The Bible says in Psalm 18, I'll read to you, With the merciful thou wilt show thyself merciful, and with an upright man thou wilt show thyself upright. With the pure thou wilt show thyself pure, and with the froward thou wilt show thyself froward. You know, forward is not a good thing. You know, it's a bad thing. But what it's showing us there is that God is going to behave toward us the same way we behave toward other people. The way we treat other people, that's how God's going to treat us. You know, so when it comes to, you know, our, our brothers and sisters in Christ, we got to be very key, careful how we treat them, that we treat them well, that we, you know, be willing to give them and help them as needed, because God takes notice of all that. And he's saying, look, I'll show myself forward with the forward, and I'll show myself upright with the upright. So that's something that, you know, we don't want to be selfish, greedy people. And if you would, go back to Deuteronomy where you were. Actually, keep something in Matthew 6. I'm sorry, keep something in Matthew 6. Now, I don't know if you noticed there in, in verses 7 through uh, 10, I'll read to you in Deuteronomy. If you're there, you can look at it as well. But how often the heart is what's mentioned. You know, that's the real problem. That's where this all stems from. He says, If there be a poor man of one of thy brethren within thy gates in thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not harden thine heart. Right? He said, the, Beware lest there be a thought in thy wicked heart. He said, Thine heart shall not be grieved when thou givest unto him. So the problem when people getting greedy and selfish and unwilling to lend and to help is a heart problem. You know, it's something that's wrong with their heart. And look there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Jesus said, Lay not up yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And you wonder, you know, why is it some people just don't want to serve God like other people? It's because their heart isn't there. Because their treasure is in other things. It's on earthly things. Whether it's jobs or money or possessions or vacations or, you know, and I'm not saying there's wrong, anything wrong with those things. They all have their, their time and place. But where, where are you laying up your treasure? Where, what are you investing in? Is it in heavenly things? Is it a heavenly reward? Or is it just gain, you know, being, uh, gaining things here? And gaining things on the earth that are just going to, the Bible says, rust and, and grow old and decay and someone might even break through and steal them. You know, I'm putting all my money in the, in the stock market. Well, make sure you're not investing in some pond. You know, Bernie Madoff isn't getting your cash. You know, and, just, and you're not going to have anything to show for it. You know, you could have invested that money in God's work and, and God would have blessed you for it. So when we see a brother or sister or somebody come along who's truly in need and truly you know, destitute and, and really on, on falling on hard times, that's an opportunity for us to help them and, and for God to, 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 to bless us for doing so. It's a way to ensure that when our turn comes, if and when it comes, 
that someone will be there for us, that God is going to make sure that he'll, he'll take care of us when we fall on hard times. And it's an opportunity for us to lay up treasures in heaven where there'll be a great reward. You know, maybe you won't get all that. You know, Lord, I've been helping all these people out you know, all these years and I've ne it never seems to come back to me. Well, maybe it's in heaven. You know, I'll take that reward. That's eternal. That's going to last. Now, if you would, turn back to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 15. Now he's saying here, look, we're going to have plenty of opportunity to do all this because of the fact it says in verse 11, for the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I command thee, saying, thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother, to thy poor and to thy needy in thy land. And if thy brother and Hebrew man or Hebrew woman be sold unto thee and serve thee six years, then in the seventh year thou shalt let him go free from thee. So, you know, that's, that's, these are some verses. This is where it gets a little more interesting here. Like, this is a new concept. This is not something we practice in modern day America. And let me just come out and say this. This is not slavery, okay? This is not someone being, you know, taken captive against their will, you know, and brought to a strange land or whatever and forced into labor, and, you know, without end, and being oppressed. It, that's not what this is. This is more of an indentured servitude, you know? It's, a, it's binding someone by, you know, a, as an apprentice or a laborer, you know, so that they can work off debt, and uh, I'll just, you know, and, and people, they hear this and they go, well, I don't know about that. I mean, is, is that, well, that's what the Bible says. And the Bible says every word of God is pure. And that his ways are above our ways. And God knows better than we do, okay? And, and it's just maybe we, it rubs us the wrong way just because it's a new concept to think that, hey, if we can't pay this back, it might just, we might just have to go work for that person and work off the debt. We might actually have to be sold onto another person to work these things, you know, sell ourselves into labor to work off debt. I mean, that's what it's teaching here. <coughs> now, this is a, and this is a better system than what we have, okay? Because in this system that God sets up, uh, the lender, right, the person who lent the money or what we might consider the victim of the crime, you know, the person who's not going to get their money back because of whatever reason, they are the one that has profited, you know, and they're guaranteed a profit. You know, just because you take someone to a modern-day court of law and sue them for money, that does, that's no guarantee you're going to get that money. They'll just say, well, I don't have it. No, there's just nothing to take. How are you going to get paid? You're not. At least in this system, you're getting something for your money. They're going to come work for me. You know, and with, with four kids in the house, you know, and, and my wife's busy, am I busy? You know, we could use some help around there, you know. We could put some people to work, right? We could, we could, we could do that. Of course, we'd have to have money to lend to begin with, but so that's another story. <laughs> but uh, in this system of God's, at least the person who's been offended, the person who's been taken advantage of or whatever you want to call it, the victim, is, is actually going to get restitution. The Bible says in Exodus 22, if a thief being found breaking up and be smitten that he die, there shall no sh blood be shed for him. Uh, if the sun be risen upon him, there shall be blood shed for him. So this is kind of a side note. It's going somewhere. But just real quickly, the Bible's teaching here that you just can't shoot somebody who comes to your house in the daytime. It's saying, if the sun be risen upon him, uh, there shall be blood shed for him. Meaning, you know, if you see some, because here's the thing, if, if they're coming into your house, and I've heard stories about this, people breaking into someone's house during the daytime, not knowing the person was home, and then that person, you know, the thief being this close to being killed or severely hurt without even knowing it. You know, they turn around and there's a gun pointed at them. Or there's some guy holding a golf club ready to take their head off. You know, I've heard of these kind of stories. The Bible's saying that would not be the right thing to do. That if someone breaks into your house, and this is an important thing because I think a lot of people in, in, you know, in the gun culture and things like that, some people get an attitude that, that they're, just, they're just itching to plug somebody. You know, I've run into guys like that. They think, oh, I, I hope somebody comes in my yard, tries to take my whatever. You know, they'll get a lead salad if they come around here. The Bible says if you do that during the day, that blood shall be shed for that thief. And guess whose blood he's referring to? Yours. You know, and, and, and you see these signs on people put up, forget the dog, beware of the owner, it's got a gun pointing at you, you know. And it's like, that's, that's not a good attitude to have. That's not biblical. You know, and, and some people, anyway, I'm, I'm not going to go off. But he's saying, look, but if the sun be not risen upon him, then it's justified. You know, you're breaking into my house in the dark, in the middle of the night. I don't know what you're there for. You know, bad, bad intentions. I'm going to assume you're there to do the worst things. So you're going down. And at that point, the Bible says, A-OK. -okay. Right? But verse 4, he says, If the theft be certainly found in his hand alive, 
The guy makes it out, right? He gets out of there. He doesn't take the, the nine iron to the head. You know, he, he gets out, he has it, and then he's later caught. He says, whether it be ox or ass or sheep, he shall restore double. You know, he didn't say uh, he shall go before the magistrate and be sentenced to, you know, whatever amount of time in jail. You know, he's going to get the minimal, <coughs> minimum penalty or whatever. He's going to spend years in prison. That doesn't profit anybody except the prison system. Nobody makes any... How does that help the victim? Like, oh, you know, maybe he gets his, his ox or his ass restored. But the Bible says he shall restore double. At that point, I almost want people to steal from me. If I knew I was going to get twice the amount back, you know, maybe I'd, I'd go out there and kind of leave that ox kind of a little bit too close to the open fence, you know. No leash on it, just do 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 do, you know. <laughs> trying to get a second ox out of the deal, right? But wouldn't you rather have that? I mean, if somebody came and stole your car, and they said, hey, we can either send this person to jail, or we can give you another car. What would you take? I'd say, give me that car, right? Who wouldn't? Now, this could also take the form of, I believe, like a, a garnishing of wages. You know, if, if someone steals or they fail to pay back, you know, you, you, could, uh, you could even, you know, uh, send them to work for somebody else. And then, you know, part of their wages, like, because let's say, you know, maybe I don't have the work for them to do. I don't even need, like, they're going to, oh, I'm going to come work for you. Well, I got everything covered. I don't need you. You know, you owe me money or whatever. And, and you say, well, I'll work it off. Well, I don't have any work for you to do. Well, at that point, I could send you to go to work for somebody and get part of your wages, like a wage garnishment. That would be another thing that could take place in the system. Look at verse 13. He says, And when thou sendest him out free, thou shalt not let him go away empty. So it wasn't just that, you know, this guy was going to work for six years and then have nothing to show for it. You know, he one, he's going to work off the debt, the money that he owed, or maybe something that he stole or whatever. And then he, when he gets sent out, when, the year, when, he, when he's set free after six years, and he's not going to go away empty-handed. He's saying, you should not let him go empty. Thou, verse 14, thou shalt furnish him liberally out of thy flock. And not just give him some meager little parting gift. You know, thanks for coming. Here's a participation trophy or, you know, a consolation prize. Say, no, you're going to load him up. You're going to furnish him liberally out of thy flock and out of thy floor and out of thy wine press. Of that wherewith the Lord thy God shall bless thee, thou shalt give unto him. So, you know, this guy wasn't going to leave and have nothing to show for it. He was going to have some things. He was going to be, because uh, think about it. And this is perfect. You know, if you, if you, this guy, let's say someone has to work off the debt that they owe you, right? They're sold unto you. And you put them to work in the field or, or whatever, okay? And then it's time for them. They've worked it off. It's time for them to go. And now they go away with nothing. They're right back in the same position where they started, having to go borrow money again. See how it's just a vicious cycle? So he's saying, look, you're going to get you're going to get restitution. In fact, you're going to get more than that. We'll see this in a minute. You're going to even get more than just the money paid back. And, and you know what? And then you're going to furnish him so now he can start off on the right foot and get out of this vicious cycle of lending and serving and lending and serving. <laughs> he says there in verse 15, and thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt, and the Lord thy God redeemed thee. Therefore I command thee this thing today. <clears throat> He's saying, look, why are you going to do all this? Because if I hadn't redeemed you, you'd still be doing backbreaking labor as a slave in Egypt. And, you know, there's no sense in making life harder than it needs to be for people. You know, we don't, not everyone needs to be on easy street, but, you know, there need, God's very reasonable, saying, look, let them work off the debt and then let them start out on life. Right, you know, let them get off, off to a new foot. A new, a new lease on life. You know, and this just, this whole thing just goes to show us, you know, the generosity, the giving, uh, you know, sending away the, the, the labor, not sending away empty handed, that, you know, our goal in life should not to see how, st be how stingy we can be. That we shouldn't just move through life trying to squeeze blood out of a rock, as the saying goes. You know, that we should be very open handed people, that we should be willing to just give. You know, that generosity, really, that, that is something that should define us as Christians. Look here in verse 16. It says, And it should be, if he say unto thee, I will not go away from thee, because he loveth thee in thine house, because he is well with thee. So it might be this guy comes in to work off some debt and say, Hey, you know what? I love living here. I love working for you. I just want to stay. And he says, And if you agree to that, great. Then he can stay. 
And then thou shalt take an awl, which is like that sharp, pointy, it's like a punch, basically. Thou shalt take an awl and thrust it through his ear. Now, it's not talking about through his ear. It's talking about like through his ear, okay? I want to make that clear. In case you ever have to do this. You know, you don't need any, any lobotomies going on. So you, you thrust it through his ear, probably the lobe, you know, the, the part with the least amount of nerves in it. And he shall be thy servant forever. So another stipulation here. He's not saying put the awl in and leave it there. <laughs> he shall be thy servant forever. Nailed with the awl. Anyway, you've got to pull the awl back out. Right? And he's still your servant. <laughs> he says, it shall not seem hard unto thee. Verse 18. Uh, <coughs> and he says, uh, let me back up. Verse 17. Thou shalt take an awl and thrust it through his ear into the door. And he shall be thy servant forever. And also unto thy maid servant shalt thou do likewise. So maybe it's you know, a lady who gets in this position and she wants to say, same deal. It shall not seem hard unto thee when, he, when thou sendest him away from thee. So maybe the guy does want to go. He doesn't want to stick around. And it's time for you to send him away. He's saying, look, don't, let, don't make that think that it's a hard thing for you to do. Don't get all bitter about it. Don't get all, you know, don't get, a, don't get the poochy lip, right? You know, don't get all sad faced. You know, it should not be hard unto thee. You know, you should be will it should be a good thing. That's a day of rejoicing. Hey, this guy's worked off his debt. I've profited it. He says, why should it not be hard for you? Well, look, it reads there. It says, uh, for he hath been worth a double hired servant to thee in serving thee six years. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all that thou doest. Now, I read that. And I love, that's why I love the Bible because God, he says things and he lets you figure it out. You know, God doesn't just say everything cut and dry. You know, what is so what is he, he you know, he says things. It puts us in the Bible that we actually have to stop and think about how that, what he means by that, right? And this is one of them where he says that he hath been worth a double hired servant unto thee. So how is that? How is that that this guy who is in debt to me comes and works off, my, works off his debt and then I send him away? How is that guy a worth, a, he's saying basically worth having hired two people, right? Well, it's kind of, how is he saying? Well, it's kind of, he's kind of saying, well, it's kind of been like you got a two-for-one special when that guy came to work for you and work off his debt. Well, if you think about it, <coughs> and this is kind of how I reasoned it, and hopefully it makes sense, you know, hopefully I'm right about this. He says, if they paid you the debt, you know, uh, that basically look at it this way, you know, you've paid, they've paid you debt that you would have spent on somebody else's labor, right? So if, I'm, if, I'm, uh, if I own a field or whatever, I have a business and a guy owes me money, and he comes to work off that debt and I put him to work in my business. You know, he's doing work that I would have paid somebody else. Right? So if, let's say he's in debt to me and he pays me that money. Well, I just have to turn around and give that money to somebody else to do the same work he's going to do. So he's saying he's worth double because not only is he paying back the money in the form of labor, but you're also profiting from his labor. That's why people hire other people to make them money. You know, that's, that's, that's a good motto to have on the job, by the way. I'm here to make the company money. You know, bosses don't hire people because, you know, they just feel bad for you or something. They're, you're there to make them money, right? And that's the attitude we ought to have. So this guy comes to you, he's indebted to you, you're going to put him to work and he's going to work the debt off in a position that you otherwise would have paid wages for. And now he's working off not only the debt, but he's also making you money. So hopefully that make, that's how I understand it. Why is, how is he worth double? Because, you know, you're not paying for labor that you otherwise would have paid for, and you're still making money on top of that. You know, he's profiting you. <coughs> so he goes on in verse 19, he says, All the firstling males that come of thy herd and of thy flock thou shalt sanctify unto the Lord thy God. Thou shalt do no work with the firstling of thy bullock, nor shear the firstling of thy sheep. So, you know, this kind of, it kind of shifts gears here real quick. It goes from talking about the poor and people working off their debt and at the very end here, he kind of mentions this, that, you know, any of the herd of the flock, all the first thing of the males, you know, they are, they are holy unto the Lord. They are, God, they are gods. And if you think about it here, he says that they shall do no, do no work with the first, firstlings of thy bullocks. Because they, you know, it wasn't like that bullock was born and then they just immediately sacrificed it on the Lord. You know, they would wait, you know, and they would usually go like every three years and they would take their tithe with them, as we read last week, and they would sacrifice and they would give. <laughs> and uh, he's saying, look, so that the all the time you have that bullock, he's not to do any work. He's like the Kobe beef, right? The cows that are suspended and get massaged every day <laughs> so they're nice and tender. But he's not to do any work at all. And, but really, what is that? Why is that? Because it's symbolic of Christ. You know, that because, it, because it, one, because it belongs to God. You shouldn't be 
using that which belongs to God, you know, for yourself, that that's God's just because you have to hang on to them until till the time comes to go and sacrifice them. You know, it doesn't mean you get to use them. But I think it's also symbolic of the fact that salvation is by grace and not of works. He's showing, look, you know, there, there's no, you're not to be working uh, <coughs> with this animal. He says, Thou shalt eat it before the Lord thy God year by year in the place which the Lord shall choose, and thou and thy ho household. If there be any blemish therein, and if it be lame or blind or have any ill blemish, thou shalt not sacrifice it unto the Lord thy God. You know, elsewhere he tells you to replace it with another one. So again, this is just more symbology of Christ. You know, this is symbolic of the fact that Jesus Christ was perfect, that he was holy, that he was God, that he was divine. You know, and that's in 1 Peter chapter 1. You see that reiterated where he says, For as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conver conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So these are just, you know, these rules are in place because these animals are symbolic of Christ. That, uh, you know, it was a picture. Now, of course, sacrificing those animals is not what saved them. They understood that. You know, they were always saved by faith. They just understood that this is a picture of what God is going to do in the future. <clears throat> he says in verse 22, Thou shalt eat it within thine gates. The unclean and the clean person shall eat it alike as the row book and as a heart. Only thou shalt not eat the blood thereof. Thou shalt pour it upon the ground as water. Again, because the blood is what sanctifies us. You know, it's, it's symbolic that it was to be poured out like Christ's blood was poured out for us. So <clears throat> it's an interesting chapter. You know, it, it, you know, parts of it might, in our modern society, you might say, well, that's archaic, that's barbaric. But it's better. It's, it's frankly better. That, you know, because in, in God's system, the people who have been offended are the ones that a, a, a restitution is made to. It doesn't go into some system. You know, and people, we see that people are able to, you know, make their amends with individuals and society and move on with their life. That it's not just hung over their head for the rest of their life. So God's system is better because of these things. That people are getting paid back and they're able, people are able to make things right once and for all and move on with their lives. And the other thing is too, if you think about it, if we actually put this system into practice, you know, people would probably, likely, I would hope, work harder to stay out of debt. If you knew that there's a possibility that if I don't, am not able to pay this back, I could end up working for this individual. <coughs> I could end up having to go live in their household, in some quarters somewhere, you know, eat at their table and working in their field. You know, you'd probably be a little more careful before you, you know, sign that contract or whatever, you know, ask for that loan. <coughs> and you probably work harder to, to pay for things with cash or stay out of debt. Uh, you know, if bankruptcy wasn't an option, you know, where you could just say, well, I just claim bankruptcy. You know, that's what people do today. They get it, they get it in it over their head. Well, bankrupt, you know, and, and it, not that there aren't, that doesn't make things difficult, but, you know, <laughs> that it's kind of like a get out of jail free card. And the person, the true victim in the whole thing, you know, is not the person who went into debt. It's the person who's out all the money, you know. Uh, they are the ones getting restored. But, you know, really the overarching kind of theme here in this, this, this chapter that we can learn from this is that we need to be generous people. And that's what God, and not have evil, wicked, hardened hearts when it comes time for us to help another person out, help a brother and sister in Christ, that we should not be doing these things grudgingly, that we should, you know, that there's a reward for it, you know, that, and that we're laying up treasures in heaven, that God is going to take care of us when our turn comes to be in need, and uh, that God notices all these things. You know, we should be willing to help those in need just as God was willing to, you know, help us freely to a much greater degree. I mean, think of how much God did for us. You know, we could, no, we could never even begin to pay back what God did for us. And, you know, that's why we should be generous people. That's why, because so much has been done for us already, <clears throat> and we should be willing to help others. You know, generosity is something that ought to define who we are as people. Let's go ahead and pray.